One participant shared that the K-State Garden Hour series is delightful, informative, and helpful. Eight out of 10 K-State Garden Hour participants reported increasing their physical and or emotional health through the skills they gained in our webinars. 82% of Kansas Garden Hour participants harvested fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs they grew with the help of our webinars. 90% of K-State Garden Hour participants reported they used unbiased and research-based information to solve plant and garden problems after participating in our webinars. Plant heroes wear purple. Discover K-State Garden Hour at ksre-learn.com slash K-State Garden Hour and become your own garden superhero. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 K-State Garden Hour Spring Kickoff Series. If, you, if this is your first time with us, welcome. If you're a regular, thank you for coming back and joining us again today. We're happy to have you. This webinar series began in the spring of 2020 as a hope to share extension gardening ed education during the height of the pandemic. With much success, we have reached over 16,000 garden enthusiasts just like you. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension. My name is Kelsey Hattisall, and I am the horticulture agent for River Valley District. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline, but most of all, we have a love for educating and sharing important gardening topics. Before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Please use the Q&A feature for questions related to this presentation. This is where we will look for questions during the Q&A session at the end. You, you could see that button along the bottom of the tab and it should say Q&A. Just click on that and you'll be able to enter your questions. Our moderators for today are Pam Paulson and Calla Edwards. They will be sharing information throughout the chat during the presentation and they will also be helping us facilitate the Q&A portion of this webinar. Just a reminder, this webinar is recorded and it will be posted on our K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources related to each topic as well. If we have shared links through the chat, we will update them on the website. Our website is also where you can have access to the previous topics, as well as the upcoming topics for the rest of the 2022 series. Today's topic is Landscape Design 101. Designing a new flower bed or revamping a current one can be intimidating for any gardener. With just a few simple design principles, you can be more confident in choosing plants for the, those areas. I am pleased to introduce to you our speaker today, Travis Carmichael. He is the horticulture and community development agent in Lyon County. He'll give us just a few moments while we transition to his presentation and he can take it away. Thank you, Kelsey, as we switch screens here. So yes, we're going to be talking about landscape design 101, um, viewing some of the poll questions everyone answered. I'm kind of excited to see where everyone has fallen on some of the concepts we're going to talk about today. So as we go through, feel free to pop those questions in the Q&A and we will get to a lot of them uh, at the, the end of, of the presentation. And I think here, as we get started, if everyone sees fit, we will go ahead and end today's poll so we can move forward. Thank you. All right, so landscape 101. Landscape design, as a lot of us may know, it has several different goals, backgrounds to it. Um, Generally, it's an arrangement of the plant material by its form, texture, and color. Uh, we're using it to fill our outdoor spaces that make it more aesthetically pleasing to ourselves, uh, public, and also have some functional purposes to it. And then also the upside to that is, is it will help um, with um, home value as well. Um, as we, we move through things. But we're, the biggest thing is, we'll go back to, you'll hear me say a lot, is it comes down to the homeowner's preference and needs. 
And also with it, if you, depending where you live at, it will help with um, noise reduction, can help with erosion. If you have uh, water issues, I can speak from experience. Our backyard likes to fill with water when we get our heavy rains. So doing some different landscaping techniques will have helped with erosion control. And as I mentioned, it will help increase the property value to your home. And as we go through this, um, Pam will be popping some links into the um, chat box, as it was mentioned before. And I'll just kind of briefly hit on them because we're going to be covering a lot of stuff here before we jump into talking about the initial parts to landscape design. But there are um, some publications that are still <clears throat> relevant. There's one that's a little bit older. Uh, it's still available at the K-State Bookstore. Uh, called Residential Landscape Design. Uh, a lot of the concepts we'll be talking about today are in that um, publication. So you can visit that. And also, I won't hit on it a lot because that's basically another talk, but there will be some publications as well on um, plants um, and plant selection publications of recommended plants for the state of Kansas. Um, and so I won't really go into that. We'll talk about using plants and their functions in the landscape, but that's about as far as we'll get into the topic today. So we're going to kick off, where do we initially start with a landscape design? And that's basically doing a site analysis or basically taking inventory of what's already there on the property. So we're, we're going to kind of look at how it generally lays, what's the location of the current trees, flower beds, fences, where does the house sit in relation to the property lines, and then taking those initial measurements of how big the property is, the measurements of the house, uh, any out, outbuildings that may be there uh, to really encompass the entire property if, if we're going to do an entire um, design for the property. Uh, this is where we will we'll start. So just to kind of give you some ideas of what you will see when you initially take the drawings, it's always a good idea to put these down on paper. Um, I know you can always have things in the back of your mind, but then when trying to explain it to someone, it can be a little, little hard without the drawing. But so we'll put down where the house sits, as I mentioned, relatively to the property lines. Then it's not a bad idea to put in where the sun may be uh, located as it moves across the sky during the, the fall, winter months, and summertime. Of course, you can see here in, um, in this photo, they, they put in the existing trees. They also located where septic system is in electrical lines. And also, um, well, actually that's on the next page, but the septic system, and then you'll see here, they've added then the electrical lines. They've also put in, um, any easements that may be there um, and, and whatnot as they move in. They've also indicated which way the slope of the land is. So for drainage purposes and also for whenever you go and put in um, any other features as beds or say retaining walls, it, it's a good idea to kind of know which way the land is sloping. That way you can uh, make sure we get enough product, especially when it comes to retaining walls um, to get things mapped out. So that's what kind of goes into that original site analysis. Uh, and we also go around, locate any windows, doors, um, sidewalks leading up to the house. So we're not blocking those when we create our, our design as we move throughout the process. And I'll hit on this kind of here. The main reason we also want to know where city easements are is so we don't put a lot of uh, things in that area. Unfortunately, with city easements, if we was to go plant a landscape bed through there, if they have to come through and do work, those areas will get um, dug up and tore out at our expense as homeowners. So you always wanna know where those lie. Also know if there's any um, flood drainage areas. I have an area in the, my backyard that is under easement due to drainage for uh, pretty much our area of town kind of drains through our, our yard and backyard. And we have big drainage um, 
sewer back there with the grates and that. So we, we have to keep that in mind as well when we work on our landscape at, at my property. From that, <clears throat> excuse me, from that site analysis, we'll move into more of a needs assessment. We wanna figure out what we're going to have in the defined spaces, and we'll talk about those in a second. This is where you also take the time to write down what are some of your favorite trees, shrubs, <clears throat> excuse me, other plants, as well as maybe any special features you want. Do you want a little pond? Do you want a fountain? Have some of that trickling noise. Uh, put down where we're going to have then our utility areas and service areas, places for clothesline, vehicles, any confinements for pets, uh, play areas for the kids. And then again, we also bring back in any zoning regulations and, and restrictions with easements and, and whatnot that may be there from uh, each individual's particular city settings. So when we talk about the kind of the locations and defined spaces, we kind of have three general areas. Uh, first one is the public space. This generally is the area that faces the street. This is what gives us our curb appeal. So uh, if you kind of sit in the middle of the block, of course, it's going to be your main front yard. If you're someone that has more of a corner lot, then we're looking at this may extend around to a couple sides of the house. And we can also, you know, change that as well with whatever we put in maybe for screens, whether that's plants or uh, fences, but that's generally what our public space is, what faces everyone will see of the street, or I should say what everyone from the street will see of your house. The private area will be where you want to escape to enjoy your, your property. So generally a lot of times it's in the backyard, that's a deck or patio location. This might be where I like to use the example, you may have your hot tub or a, a pool area that you'll ward off that you're going to have your gatherings, your fun time outside will be that private space. And then the service utility area, this may be where you have a vegetable garden, uh, where you put trash cans, compost pile, vehicles, those type of locations are what we call then service areas. Now you can go through and basically take a copy of your site analysis and kind of create a bubble um, bubble diagram of that to kind of put in to perspective so you can see where you will have these areas. So you can see here in this photo, you know, the entrance have a clear path for the front of the house. They've included areas they want buffers from the neighbors to create more of some private spots and then you can see in the backyard where they have their outdoor living area and pet space. So that's kind of the initial start to designing the landscape is taking those original uh, measurements, getting the lay of the land, sitting down thinking what you want, and then we move into actually sitting down and designing the, the process uh, in eventually we get to the point where we'll pick plants, but this is where we start with uh, the lay of the land of how we're going to lay out the landscape and anything else we may add. So some of our basic design principles for landscape design is we'll be talking a little bit about the balance of a landscape. We'll go over the focal point. We'll talk about having more of a simplistic or simplicity within that um, design. We'll throw in briefly a little bit on rhythm and line. We'll talk about scale. That tends to be the biggest issue. I'm pretty sure most of my uh, co-workers on today can relate that we can drive around town and see who didn't follow those um, plant labels when they planted plants because scale is out uh, or it may have they thought it was going to stay small and ended up way too big for the space. And then we talk about bringing it all together. So those are our six main design concepts we're going to cover today. So briefly to hit on this, balance is kind of what creates that weight within the landscape. Are we going for a more symmetrical or asymmetrical type um, appearance of our house? And I should, before we move forward, hit on this just briefly. 
when you're thinking of what you want for your landscape, you want to also decide at that point, do we want a more formal look or more of a contemporary informal? Because that will um, kind of choose the path you use as we move through the next few sets of slides of, uh, of how you design and pick out things for your, your landscape. So symmetrical is more of our formal look. Everything mirrors each other on either side. Generally, this is where we have more well-groomed manicured shrubs within the front of the house, uh, creating that more stately look. Asymmetrical, it will be different plants on either side, but together they create more that whole nice look in front of the house. And that is more of our informal look, which anymore, that is generally what most folks choose when they're doing landscapes, but there are still some. Also, it comes down to the type of house, uh, like that real nice formal look, that real manicure look. Uh, unfortunately, that is a little bit more higher maintenance. And most folks that I've talked to and of my master gardeners, they prefer the lower maintenance side, which can be um, that asymmetrical look but I will also put this out there. There is no, no maintenance landscape. There is always going to be some maintenance within the landscape, whether that's weeding or keeping things pruned and cleaned out. So just keep that in mind as we move forward as well. And this here just kind of puts those line drawings more into perspective with colored photos. You can see there the formal symmetrical look with the, the trim shrubs versus that more uh, informal asymmetrical look has a little more swooping lines than straight lines when we compare the two. And pretty much the same here. The, also, the other goal with the balance, especially when we're doing that asymmetrical look, is, is we're trying to pull the eye to the front door when we are landscaping that public space. So everything we do will try to point the way to make our house more welcoming to visitors and folks who are, are driving by. So then we go move into what's known as a focal point. This is something that is a strong feature within the landscape. It could be um, a fountain, it could be a bird bath, a container, it could be a unique plant. Uh, it's really can come down to what you prefer that focal point to be. But it's something that we want the eye to be drawn to. And a lot of times it's more of a conversational piece in some landscapes. So here you can see in these two photos, the containers in both of those are going to be more of the focal point. And then we move to this one in the fall, that red tree is going to be the focal point. So it can be something that maybe changes throughout the season. Uh, but generally it has that spot taken throughout the, the year with that uh, drawing the eye in for everyone to see. So this is where we'll take a little more of our time and, and discuss is having simplicity within the landscape. This is where we strive to make everyone comfortable when they are seeing the garden, things aren't hectic. We like to keep it more groupings of like plants together, if possible. This is where we have the soft curving lines to make it more relaxing, try to create that park setting. Now, there are times and places where straight lines will be needed within borders and plants that we try to use to either move the eye fast forward through an area or try to um, basically hide an area. But we try to do more simplicity. And this photo here kind of shows it the best where the upper portion, we have groupings of like plants uh, and it, we have the different heights going on at different locations versus the bottom one. I actually known an individual who this is what his yard looked like. He was also a plant collector and didn't care what the landscape looked like. But um, so he, whatever he got, he planned it wherever there was an open location. And so it's just like a hodgepodge randomness. And that's not what we're going for when we're trying to plan a landscape. Um, we want that more calming. We can pick the fun plants and put them in, but also we need to 
pull in and have the nice line so it doesn't create this mess of different heights and plant textures like we see in the bottom photo. We want something more like this photo here where we have that grouping under the trees, there's height in the back versus the randomness of all sorts of different topiaries, uh, different textures, heights, craziness going on uh, within this particular landscape. And then also with simplicity is we want to reduce clutter. So if we can create landscape beds, that's the best way to do it. So putting in like a berm if we need to is a great way to clump plants together versus just wherever they fit randomly planting, putting some mulch rings around and calling it good. This kind of creates one, this is a mowing nightmare. Two, it also is just, it makes that yard very uneasy, not well attractive. So it, it's bringing all things together, making it the best it can be for, for ourselves and for those who are visiting. So as we pick some of these plants or I guess planning the overall design, sometimes certain aspects of the design principles kind of happen. Rhythm and line is something I briefly talk on when even when I present this to uh, master gardeners and others. But when we pick the other parts of uh, the design process, whether that's um, how we group plants together, what we're choosing, some of this kind of just, it kind of happens a little bit. And that is with the rhythm and line, we're finding that focal point, drawing the eye in. We're also using plants and the textures to do that. And I'll get to how we can create line with plants. Um, but the rhythm can really, it kind of can present itself as we're picking plants to go in. So we're having that grouping and then we may repeat later, but it's having those nice continuous intervals of plants um, to give the interest. So it can kind of just, in a sense, happen as we're picking, as long as we're not randomly placing one plant here, a couple here, as long as it's all kind of going together, that rhythm kind of comes in uh, as, a, as well. So in this photo here, you can see we have some daylilies in the front, we have some lower stuff as we move through the back, but there is, it's not, it's not a hodgepodge, it's all working together, they're moving around, creating kind of that rhythm, because we're also breaking it up a little bit with uh, more of a silver dusty color leaf as we move to the back. Also in this photo, I really see the rhythm come out when we look, we have the two types, the hostas there, and then the red in between. So that is creating a rhythm. It's kind of like a pattern um, and going back and forth. Uh, so that's where rhythm comes in. So if we put that, you know, if we're putting some of those plants together, it kind of already happens in itself, but keep that in the back of your mind. We don't want it to be too crazy I'll hit on this again, but we don't want more of what we'll, I'll term as a circus effect of too much going on, but having them working together. The line though, to me, this is where, this is one of the take home points I want everyone to focus on. The lines can really affect how the landscape comes out. So these can be curved, linear, going, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, but they help your eye move through the landscape. And this is where I mentioned this when we we're talking about formal and informal landscapes, and they can be used back and forth, but straight lines are very forceful. They're going to direct your eye to the focal point very rapidly. And we're not going to take our time getting there. We're going to get to what we want everyone to see fast. So if we need to say we're trying to hide something, we're going to do some more straight lines because that's how our eye is trained, is going to go past that as fast as possible. Versus using more curving lines, it's going to be more graceful, relaxing, and we're pulling more things in from nature on that line. So that tends to be where most folks want, especially if it's in their um, 
private space where they're going to be sitting relaxing. We want things to kind of be a little more natural. But again, this is everyone's own um, perspective. So someone may like more of the formal um, setting. So you will have more of those forceful direct lines versus curving more natural. The best thing to do when it comes to figuring out what you want when it comes to rhythm of li and line is to go out and, and see what mother nature has done. We can pull a lot of inspiration from just taking a look at what mother nature has done naturally and pulling that into the landscape. So if we're really wanting to see more how some of the curves and the swooping lines work, go out and see what mother nature herself has done and pull that into the landscape. And that's kind of what we have here for, for our nice wintry creek is kind of seeing how the water moves through the landscape. So just a few rules on when we're creating the rhythm and lines is group like plants together Try to imitate nature as much as possible. Not every other plant needs to be different. I think we all can pick out some of those areas and landscapes we've seen that every plant is different, everything has a different texture, but we, by keeping things like, that helps with the eye flowing through those different plants. And just know that whenever we change something, our eye will stop and check it out. So if you're, that's why we say those different lines move to the focal point, because then things will change, our eye stops and view it. So this photo in the bottom corner, I can be first to tell most folks, this was probably the American landscape in my hometown. Um, and I can tell you exactly who the landscaper was because I used to work for them. Um, but I could drive around, tell you who put in the majority of the landscapes. Um, there was only a handful of landscapers and all of them kind of had their calling card. And doing the purple barberry mixed in with the um, lime green barberry as well as Stella de Ora de Lilies, I could tell you exactly who put most of those landscapes in. Uh, when I was in high school. So unfortunately, that is kind of, it can be distracting when it's done more as alternating like it is here. So this gives the um, more of the circus effect that we are trying not to go for. So we can use color and I recommend using color, but there comes a place to where you know, we want a little more green and then using the pops of colors more as accents, not as here we are. Um, I know of another place um, that they love pop of color and their pop of color is going to Hobby Lobby and buying silk flowers and they are in the entire landscape, every container, every oh everything they're in hanging baskets they're in uh, window planners they're everywhere and that is their landscape it used to be um, red geraniums now it's more of um, sunflowers some yellows and oranges so they do change it uh, but for them i guess their landscape stays colored and whatnot even in the dead of winter when it's kind of dark and gloomy but that is not what <laughs> the purpose of our, our landscapes for that circus effect is you know definitely not what we're after all right so now we're going to talk a little bit on scale of of plants we want to try to keep everything kind of into check with the house that it's going to be put around or, or building for that um, matter as well. So um, yes, we want to have different perspectives, um, different angles for the viewers, uh, but we also want to take in consideration what areas are going to be used for uh, as well uh, as the last bullet point mentions there, you know, are we going to have kids in the area? Do we need to have something that may be um, accessible uh, for those who may have some disabilities as well. So we keep all, all those things in mind when we're choosing plants uh, and making sure we're not going to choose something too big. And 
and I should mention before we move too far, as we move through this whole process, and we'll get here in a little bit, I'll talk about putting plants down onto the paper and drawing where things go. Whenever we're planning our landscape design, we are going by the mature size of the plant. So if the when we're looking plants up or we're out in the nursery and we're reading those labels, it says for a shade tree is going to get 30 feet wide. That is what we're going to draw our plan to is that 30 foot um, width within the landscape itself. If there's some shrubs, they say they get three to four feet wide. That's what we're planning for when we're doing this. It's not the size we purchase them at. We're looking to what their mature size will be and planning from there. So this is just kind of give a representation of different scales. We've all, I know I've seen the different areas where we things are a little large for that um, property, a little large for the house they may be around versus also on the other end where things are a little too small. We try to shoot for that normal scale, kind of the mid range between the two when we're doing uh, plant selection and even drawing up the landscape. So just kind of, a few more visuals is definitely, I know places like this uh, around where I grew up where trees are huge and they're hiding the home and you can barely see the front door versus I can drive you around Emporia and find some houses that uh, maybe the Tudor style home needed a few more shrubs to go a little bit higher um, to deal with the height that the house is giving. This is generally what we're after for kind of that normal scale. Everything's kind of right for the size of the house. Also definitely looks very warming with today's weather. I could tell you I could go for sitting on the front porch of this house and enjoying the lovely weather we're going to have later today. So this brings us into unity and unity is bringing everything together, having the textures and colors supporting each other and blending together. And we'll get into this more here as we tend to talk about the different, different functions of plants within in the landscape. And I should mention, and I know I'll probably get to this here as I'm most likely jumping ahead slightly on myself, but when we start to pick plants and putting them in, the biggest thing is we're, we try to plant everything in groupings of at least three. We like odd numbers. It's a kind of, it's a design principle. So groupings of three, five, and seven, we try not to hit groupings of one. We do that mainly for focal points or items we want as that specimen type plant. Um, but other than that, we're always trying to do those um, mass plantings. So from here, we're going to move in to kind of talking about the different functions of plants in the landscape. So we'll, we'll go over kind of having them as the foundation of the landscape. We're going to go over that we, some of the different uses like screening, um, covering up features. They can help us direct foot traffic through the landscape, whether that is um, in the front of our house or even through the backyard or our private areas. Uh, they can be used as windbreaks and we'll talk about in framing in our property as well. So I kind of briefly hit on this, a specimen plant is something we're going to choose for a center of attention. It's gonna be that focal point within a location of our landscape. Uh, we're gonna make sure it has a prominent spot. I've put in landscapes where the prominent spot is, this is going to block someone's uh, big picture window, but that's because when they look out, they wanna see this every time. And so then the landscape is um, designed around that. Uh, to, so it draws it and it makes it all work together as, as the landscape is put in. So we try not to do too many focal points because again, it goes back to it'll create that circus effect. And so we try to use this more sparingly. Then we get into what's known as our foundation plantings. These are generally around the house. Uh, they help us direct the eye to the front door or any other entrances we may have within our um, 
landscapes, whether that's in the different service areas we talked about earlier. Um, but the big rule of thumb, because we use a lot of these foundation plants also to help soften the corners of our homes, is when we're planting them for the height, the mature height, we don't we want it not to go over two thirds of the height from the ground to the eave. So it should grow up to about two thirds of that height. Otherwise we kind of run into the scale being off. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind when you're, you're selecting your plants. We can also use plants as borders instead of always using hardscapes um, and other products. So we can, there's a lot of different cool plants out there we can use for, for borders um, to create different areas within our, our uh, lawns. I know most of us, when I say most of us, most of us agents, we all kind of teach landscape design slightly different than the next person. And so some folks you may hear talk about designing different rooms within our landscapes. And this is one, excuse me, this is one way to create those areas is using plants instead of hardscapes or um, I want to say different rocks or edging to create those kind of rooms within our landscape, but use plants instead. It's a nice way to create the transition between the different areas. Now, when we, when initially, woof, when we initially talked about our, our site analysis and the different areas we wanted to choose, we kind of talked about and we had on the drawing that the individual wanted to have some screens or privacy from the neighbors. We can do that with fences, but we can also do it with plants. We have a lot of good plants that create some nice barriers, uh, whether that's in the form of some of the different um, ornamental grasses. Um, but I always try to push folks to switch it up. Don't always use the same plant, put some evergreen and deciduous plants in there. That way, if something was to happen, a disease come along, we're not wiping out that entire section of your landscape. Uh, but this is a great way to hide. Maybe the neighbors keep parking their RV next to your property. You don't want to see it. Put some tall plants there to create that barrier, or you're wanting to hide um, your party space. Um, so not all the neighbors can see what's going on and all your guests, you can put up plants to help help with that. Then also when we're pulling things together as a whole and doing an entire property design, uh, we look to have plants that help um, frame in our home and property. So having trees, taller items behind the house will also help um, kind of frame in the home versus the cookie cutter home where it's bright blue sky behind and you can see everyone around. So uh, that's generally what we look for when we talk about the enframement of a home, putting plants, uh, generally trees, a lot of times behind to help give kind of that um, picture perfect look. So keep that in mind. What would it look like when you put the front of your house, if you take a photo of it, what it would look like in a picture frame. All right, and then briefly here, we're going to hit on uh, using the different color and textures and forms of plants within in the landscape. And when I first started as an extension agent about nine years ago, I had an inv individual tell me once that you know, we're moving out of always being gardeners and landscape uh, landscapers. We're becoming, everyone's getting more of the design into them because of all the plants now that we have at our disposal that have been bred for the different textures in that. So keep that in mind. They add so much interest to the landscape uh, and mix it up. Everything doesn't have to be a shrub or a perennial. Have spaces for for annuals to get some more of that nice cut leafed look on some of the plants. So that's kind of what this section's briefly over. And I like to encourage folks to go out and uh, look for when they choose plants. <clears throat> so when it comes to the color, 
this can this does have a strong effect on the landscape so as i mentioned before so we don't have that circus effect be very cautious what you choose for color and how often it appears generally the landscape should be about 80 to 90 percent natural foliage and then we're using that color to accent the different places so we want to complement the house so um I'll pick on my house again, we have kind of a turquoise front door. So picking uh, plants that will go with that that doesn't distract and also don't clash is sometimes a little bit of a hard task, but we, we seem to pull it off. But keeping that in mind as well, pulling elements from that to be in different locations as well as what we try to do. And also just keep in mind, whenever we alternate colors, that tends to break up um break up the landscape causes our eye to stop so kind of like in the upper photo there we have the candy cane look as i mentioned we i've seen multiple houses we can go back and talk about the house that plants silks uh this can kind of um that kind of fits that house versus the the bottom photo there is more foliage and then we've pulled in some different colors in um in with the reddish leaves, the red flower uh, there in the to the left of the front door. So also keep in mind to kind of what you're going for for the color schemes. When you look at monochronic color scheme, we're kind of staying with the same shades of one tone. So maybe we're more in the reds or the oranges. Uh, versus complementary where we're going across that color wheel. So the color wheel can very, be very helpful when trying to figure out what you want within a landscape. So if you're ever trying to find that, it, it's real easy to type in on um, a web search for a color wheel to help you with that. So I know we've, I've thrown a lot at everyone over the last 20 minutes, but as we bring everything together when we talk about creating our landscape beds and picking plants and going so going on when we take that initial that initial site analysis and turn it into our final drawing we're already going to have the house and existing plants and items there from there we're going to add the trees first and work our way then from the tree height down to the shrubs and then into the flowers from there and eventually then we get in even more nitpicking of what's in the landscape what softens the corners of the house and so forth so the biggest thing though is i want everyone to remember is you start with placing trees first and working your way down it's also a good idea to keep in mind uh, maybe some of your different soils know the plants you're choosing maybe we have to change soil ph a bit so it's not a bad idea to have a soil test done uh, you can bring those into your local county um, offices we can send those off and test them for you um, know the sun exposure um, that tends to be a question that comes in too. folks don't always read those labels and plant something that should not take full sun, but that's where it's at. And so they can't figure out why it's um, bleaching or the leaves are getting burnt. Kind of know the wind direction. Uh, again, remember that mature size of the plants. Uh, then of course we get into bed shapes. There's all sorts of fun stuff um, we can use to help draw bed shapes. I should have taken photos of everything, um, but when we start to draw the actual um, design. There's circle templates you can get. I have some, um, instead of buying French curves, there are um, curve helpers, I guess you could call them, where we can mold it into whatever shape we want to help uh, draw the different uh, landscape borders as we place those within the drawing. So you can look for those uh, at the different uh, hobby stores. Uh, to assist you with um, putting those in. And then, of course, finally, also remember those special features, any uh, focal plants or focal points you want to highlight or special items you want to put in, whether that's, a say, a pond or a fountain within in the landscape. And when we 
put it all down on paper and finish it up. This should generally be what it looks like. Um, for those who have, of us who've done some landscape design, the different textures of the circles that you see on the paper tell us what kind of plant it is. So there, um, some of them that are more spiky means it's more of an evergreen versus the ones like up here where it says orchard, that is going to be more of um, a deciduous type plant. You can also search for those um, on the, do a web search for those as well, type it into Google and get the different diagrams uh, for landscape design. It's basically just to help us, diff help you visualize and differentiate between the different plants that are chosen for the area that you're, you're planting. And then of course, don't forget to label them, whether that's using a numbering system, lettering system, or if you have enough room, you can even write the names on the design uh, like you see here in the, the photo. So to kind of recap what we've gone over in the last 45 minutes or so, um, the landscape design is the arrangement of plants, materials by form, texture, and color. The goal is to make this enjoyable for yourself and also maybe for your neighbors, enhance the neighborhood a little bit. Uh, don't forget to conduct that needs assessment. Write down what you want. Um, nothing more, I guess, upsetting or disappointing when you get done and you realized, oh, I wanted to really do this and why, you know, where was that in my notes? So try to put down all your thoughts, take time, don't rush any of this. Take your time on it, that way you get it to kind of the way you want when you, uh, move through. Also perform the site analysis. That way you know exactly where everything is at on your, your property. And then again, um, just to kind of hit on then, don't forget the three areas um, of public, private, and the service utility areas. And obviously I forgot to take a bullet point off, but I do have edible landscapes on there are multifunctional. I had used this once to talk about also adding edibles in, so I'll make a plug for that at this point. Uh, don't be afraid when picking plants to add some vegetable crops or fruit into your landscape. Uh, there's different, different plants you can use for borders or even more, I guess you can call shrub type uh, vegetables out there, but they can also add some interest to your, your landscape. So don't be, don't be afraid to think uh, outside of the box. But the biggest thing is to have fun uh, as you um, do this process uh, and pick, pick plants. So with that, I will take any questions that have, may come up over the course of the presentation. All right, well, thank you, Travis. That was very informative and I hope everybody learned a lot. Um, I know we do have a lot of questions to get to, so Calla, if you'd like to take it away with the questions. All right, so um, one of our first questions, um, how far from the foundation of a house do you recommend keeping trees, shrubs, and bushes? Okay, so um, there's a lot of different rules of thumb uh, on that one. Um, and I've heard a lot of different ones. I tend to, First, we look at the mature size, say that it gets about three foot. I like to try to keep some of those shrubs three foot away from, from the house. That way we're not running into the issue. On the trees, we wanna look at the span of that and try to get it to where the drip line is barely touching the house. We, that way we're keeping the majority of the root system out of um, hurting that foundation uh, and that. So it's, some of it does come down to looking at the plant label, reading the, the span of the plant. Um, I, you know, and there's others that prefer a defined line. 
uh, and that's kind of sometimes hard to, to choose. But uh, when it comes to some of the shrubs, I try to stay at least three foot away from the house or an area that you can walk a little bit behind there so we're not having those roots grow into the, the foundation. All right. Um, we removed two older trees. How can we even out the landscape? Oh, um, I would say that's a good question, Akala. And um, for, for me to give, I guess, good advice on that, I would prefer to maybe see a photo. Um, so removing two older trees, we might be looking at putting something in that um, some shrubs or even a shorter ornamental tree back in to help uh, balance things out. Um, but for me personally, I would like to see a f image before I give more advice on that. Okay. Uh, are you seeing a change in plant selection due to hotter and drier summers? I would say yes, I have seen a change. I know personally I have changed some of my um, plant selections. Um, we're also seeing more of a change of folks choosing plants that are um, well adapted to um, low water use. Um, and this is probably gonna make Pam scramble a little bit. I should have added that to the list. Sedgwick County uh, has put together uh, water wise plant list. And I use that a lot in this area. I know some of the plants may not fully work statewide, but it's a good start to look at um, of plants that can handle um, some of the drier conditions. But yeah, definitely seeing a move towards that um, as water is becoming a, a, can become a hot resource. I know we've been put under water restrictions in Emporia before. And so having, having that in the arsenal is not bad when planning a landscape. Um, do you have a good landscape program or a program that home gardeners could use to design a landscape? I don't. I have tried several of the different ones and maybe um, if some of our other cohorts on today know of any, they can, someone may be able to chime in or message me, but I, I don't. Times I've tried to get a hold of some, I've always been, uh, I guess, disappointed. Um, I, but of course I've gone through training. I prefer more the pro side because um, plant selection and scaling always tends to be off for me. So I don't know of a good one off the top of my head. Okay. Um, is there a general rule of working from tall plants to low plants? Um, high in the back, low in the front, are there any exceptions or? Yeah, so generally um, in areas that may contain more of the foundation plantings, we try to put taller in the back, shorter in the front. So we have that nice look, uh, but then we can also get into areas where having some varying height is okay, but that might be more along a back fence or a fence somewhere, not around the house per se. Um, it kind of also comes down to that look you, you want. If you want it to have more of a natural native look, you're going to have some of those varying heights. It's not going to be the perfect low in the front, high in the back. Uh, but generally around the foundation of the home, we do have those different levels. Okay. Um, we did, I know you touched a little bit on it, but what kind of uh, fruits or vegetables can be incorporated into a landscape? Yes. I, um, so we can look at a lot of our um, cold crops. So you can look at putting in um, lettuce, some of the spinach, um, cabbage, kale. There's a lot of, there's some ornamental kales. There's also, of course, the edible ones as well um, that we can put in, or I should say more edible than the, the ornamental versions. 
the ornamental tends to have more of the fun colors um, for that. Um, we can look at putting tomatoes and peppers, uh, a lot of our vegetable crops we know, um, into the landscape. So I, I can't say there's ones I would maybe not think about putting sweet corn in potentially, unless that's a look you're wanting to have in the landscape. But a lot of our vegetable crops are suited for uh, putting in the landscape and, and intermixing. That way we kind of have in a multi-use landscape, especially if you don't have, have space for a traditional, traditional garden. Okay. Um, this individual ha would like to remove some shrubs in front of their foundation. Mm -hmm. Do they need to wait to plant new shrubs since those have been there for about 15 years? I would say no, just make sure you get as much of the root system out as you can so you can go back and replant. You may have to move over either way or in front so you're not back in the same hole with uh, and fighting all the roots. Uh, but generally, you should be able to replant unless there was a reason why that plant died, such as a type of disease that may live in the soil, then we'd have to think differently. But otherwise, there shouldn't be no major reason why you could not go back and put something there. If you're concerned about pH or something being off, have a soil test done. Um, if someone wanted, to, let's see, that one got answered. Um, that has hit most of them, unless you have a good suggestion on getting rid of landscape rock, old oh. landscape rock. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish I did. I had to do it the um, hard way myself, which was by shovel and scooping them all out. Um, luckily, the last bed we did that on, I had a two-year-old that was fascinated by picking up some of the rocks. So that helped it go a little bit quicker, but um, I really don't have the silver bullet for that one so okay and um if someone was going to hire a landscape company what are some things that you look for would look for when hiring a company to help do your landscaping yes so um it's not a bad idea to ask for some references from those companies uh so that could be previous um clients uh, also make sure they're um, I guess insured licensed to be able to that way if something was to happen catastrophic to one of their employees that's there as well um, but the biggest thing would be is for me would be the recommendations from previous clients um, and just kind of see what work they've done um, I know of some companies that have come into Emporia um, that don't always do the best work. So having those recommendations would be where I would, would start um, before moving forward with, with a company. And also if you can find someone who has time, I know locally we're very short numbered on um, landscapers who have openings to do jobs. They're, there's so many and then they can't, um, they don't have enough help to complete all the jobs they have. All right, so what is your favorite plant for around the foundation of a house? Oh, oh boy, you would ask that question. That's the hard one, Travis. I know. One of my all time favorites, and it's in our landscape, is I love adding, if you can, I love adding hydrangea but that is one of my all-time favorites. So I try to add it when I can. Okay. And in landscaping, um, how do you recommend keeping weeds from growing in landscape rock? Yeah, um, I like to use pre-emergence when I can. Otherwise it's either hand pulling or spot spraying um, with a weed killer um, to keep it, keep it down. All right, do we have time for one more question, Kelsey, or are we almost out of time? Sure, you can have one more. Okay, um, the question is, uh, the 
individual has cottage gardens within a hard space island. How does style and flow impact within a cottage garden? I think I'd have to, um, I'd have to do some research on that one. That, you, you picked the stumper for the last one, Calla. <laughs> um, came in, Travis. <laughs> I know, I, I would, um, I'd have to look on that one because I don't, I'm not 100% sure. That's all I have. Oh. Well, Stump and Travis seems like a good way to wrap up the garden hour for today. So once again, thank you all for joining the K-State Garden Hour series. We are so glad you could be with us today to learn about Landscape Design 101. We have several interesting sessions coming up for our spring and summer series. So be sure to visit the Garden Hour website to see all of our upcoming topics, as well as all the previous topics we have covered. Once again, this session was recorded and should be posted by tomorrow afternoon. When this webinar ends today, you will receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out as we would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you continue to tune in on the first Wednesday of each month and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>